The question is, what are Aristotle's contribution to ethics? They're enormous because Aristotle is the first person who decides, let us classify things. Let us see what is friendship. What are good things about friendship? What are defining? So what he does is not unlike sort of books on ethics uh, in ancient cultures, say, what we will find in the Bible in a couple of lectures. Uh, there will be prescriptive things. Do not. Thou shalt not. He reasons about things. This is first person who tries. He's not the first person to reason about ethics. This is, of course, Socrates or Plato, which, whichever way we parse this. This, this thing we, we talked about it. But he is the first person who, instead of giving you beautiful stories where people reason about ethics, gives you systematic thing. What is sort of what is liberality? Why is it good to share money? He thinks liberality, sharing money, is one of the great virtues. But he discusses it. He doesn't just say. Thou shalt give your money away. But he, he knows that you, shall, you, you should. But this is not the point. He's trying to reason about things in the same way he reasons about politics, the same way he reasons about animals. So that he moves ethics from something which is prescriptive to something which is part Again, the Greek revolution is that you must reason about everything. And there are different ways of reasoning, artistic reasoning, or systematic encyclopedic reasoning, as we find in Aristotle. And that's what he does. He sort of goes through and reasons and partitions again. He divides, he follows this Socratic idea of classification which Plato demonstrates multiple times. But he, Plato says, you can do it. Aristotle does do it, if, if, if you see the difference. Yes? You've given us various um, books as recommendations. I'm wondering if you could prioritize them in, in terms of. Homer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the thinking about like kind of make two prioritizations importance and then readability okay uh, the question is to it's a very important question prioritize the books one of the I, I, I sort of mentioned this great project of did I talk about Mortimer Adler in the class okay so great books lots of great books you have no chance to read them all 60 is too many. So it's very important for us to limit, to come up with a small number of books, which a person living now in this world, working for A9, could actually read. OK, I, I think, you know, I, let, let me try to give you the center of what I call the small canon for an English-speaking American living in Silicon Valley. I think that you must read Homer because if you cannot read poetry, and Homer equals poetry. That's my axiomatic thing. Everybody else is just derivation. You must, I know it's hard. Again, one of the things we don't read in poetic civilization. Again, I, you know, I talked about love. It's all related. We live in this chop, chop, chop civilization, practical. You cannot, there is absolutely no chance you could grasp Homer in two hours, 10 hours. It's, it's a commitment. And you have to read him multiple times. I insist on Homer because it is sort of the, you know, it's so very important. I did mention as number two choice, again, there are wonderful historians. 
The only historian I recommend as a must is Plutarch. Why? Because he's not really a historian. He tells stories. He's a biographer. He's a moralist. But it's a book which, again, you cannot understand Lincoln unless, unless you read Plutarch. He's just that important. You can, I mean, you have to read Plutarch. If you have extra time, Herodotus was a great historian, Thucydides was a great historian, Edward Gibbon was a good historian. This, the list is fairly short, even if we go into history. And Gibbon, however good he is, is just so huge that a modern person, 18th century gentleman of leisure, could aspire to it. Gibbon is the guy who wrote Decline and Fall of Roman Empire the greatest historical book written in English. Is it important? Yes, it is important. Should you read it? Honest answer. No. Too big. Just too big. Uh, so, so if I have two, yes, I have to insist on Plato. Uh, all of Plato? No, you cannot read all of Plato. Some of it gets very technical. Uh, I did say symposium. You should probably read a little bit more than just symposium. You, you know, every educated, civilized person should read apology. It's just 20 pages. So this is doable. So you could read this, should read the trilogy, uh, course of the trial and death of Socrates, which is uh, apology, uh, Crita, and uh, Phaedo. Uh, you know, I do think that anybody should read Gorgias. But, you know, again, start with symposium. What I said I meant. Start with symposium. Because, you know, I think love is important, you know, I said. I think you should read the definitive book on the subject. Uh, I'm going to tell you some horrible things. I'm going to tell you that, yes, you should read Euclid. But probably after that, we're going to skip lots of stuff. So we, I'm sort of answering. When we come in, uh, you know, I will not recommend for the small canon any Roman books. It's a terrible loss. It's a terrible loss, but life is short. By the way, I, some of them, like Seneca, his letters to Lucilius, it's just such wonderful stuff. I read them all the time. What? Ovid is great. Virgil is great. But life is short. Read Homer. Again, you know, sort of, you still have to find time to read Odyssey. He finished Iliad, which is a great accomplishment. But still, and you have to read it again and again. So I'm not sure I could recommend any of the Roman books. We will get, there is a book, which we will have, I'll have to talk. I know it's not politically correct, but you must read the Bible. You just must. You cannot live in Western civilization without reading. You say, all of the Bible? Of course not. And when we'll get to that, I will give very specific recommendations what to read in the Bible. Most of the Bible, you can, I mean, you shouldn't even attempt. But... You know, there are some fundamental stories you need to know, you know, about the snake. You know, you have to know. We'll, we'll talk about stories again, minded. I'm not, you're not supposed to be a Bible scholar, but you need to know, you, you should be able to go to St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome and understand the pictures. You should be able to listen to music by Handel half of which, which is based on the biblical themes. He's not a theologian, he's a composer. But if you don't know, somebody says, you know, that's, that's the story. You don't know what the story is. You, you're not going to understand. You cannot relate. You need to know, have b basic biblical literacy. We'll get to that. Uh, you have to read Shakespeare. I'm going to make enormous jump. But you must read Shakespeare. You cannot be a civilized English-speaking person without reading Shakespeare. 
You say, all sexual? No, of course not. We will choose. What? Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Will Shakespeare. Yes. Yes. You're, I mean, I'm not naming none. Of, if you haven't heard these names, you're really in big trouble. I mean, I, you know, I do not recommend any obscure books. These are books are not obscure. But they are not read. This is, this is the sad fact. When we get to Shakespeare, I'll explain what it means to know Shakespeare. I mean, right? It's, this is, believe it or not, my very short list. So, how many books? Homer, Plutarch, Plato, Euclid, Shakespeare, uh, Bible Shakespeare. Six. Well, Bible alone is well, yes, but we will, we will, yes. And Shakespeare, there are wonderful things which we'll talk about. But I have, I mean, you see, I have to set a realistic goal. If, if, I, if I give you 60 books, you will not even attempt. With six, this was your question, right, Stephanie? I mean, she wants to know priority lists. She doesn't want 60 books because where should 60 is too many. 20 is too many. With six, there is a chance. So one of the important things, important messages of this course, guys, it's doable. It's literally, it's not too late. Even for somebody who is 65 years old, or is going to be 65, he still can, <laughs> he still can catch up with just six bucks. Right. And again, think about it. If you get to the level of Lincoln, which you will get with these six bucks, that's not a bad level, right? In terms of sort of breadth of vision, ability. Again, one of the important parts of civilizing is being able to express yourself. Sort of, in order to be able to write, which is another task, you should be, learn to read. If I were teaching a real course, I would assign you compositions. Sort of write a composition. We will discuss, we'll discuss Homer, as we did, and then I'll ask you, so, why didn't they give up Helen? We require you to write six pages on why Trojans didn't give up Helen. Yes. Uh, I have a question which puzzles me like quite a bit. Like Greeks, mm. especially writers like Aristotle, particular Aristotle, which was probably a foundation for a lot of further and. Uh, do the, what his attitude uh, or any, any remark or application of his ethic to slaves, which were... Uh, what, the question is, what was the application of his ethics to slaves? In Greek society, it was very, very simple. You know, from his point of view, barbarians were not fully human. Just as simple as that. You say, no, no, but he was wrong. Well, guys, it's not as simple as all of that. It requires a very, very major revolutionary step, saying that there are radical equality between us and wild people in the jungle. Nobody saw that at that time. Nobody, not one person. Later Stoics discover some moral equivalence but not in terms of slaves are like us. Barbarians were barbarians for Greeks, and it's only certain Jew, Paul of Tarsus, his name was, who said, you know, Ellens and barbarians are the same. Ellens and Jews are the same. That was a radically new thing, not acceptable, for example, much later, if you look at, there is a famous Jewish book, which we'll not cover here, called Talmud, not part of Western civilization. The question, should you teach 
slaves, Gentile slaves, the Bible, the law. A very firm answer, no under no circumstances, not ever. We could argue why, we could discuss that, but the notion that these slaves are entitled to hear the word of God was absolutely, it might not have been believed by the Jews of before Talmud. But clearly, at some point, when Mishnah is written, they decide, no, you cannot do it. But the question was stated in Aristotle. Yes, it was stated. He clearly knew they were slaves, and he could see them. That was not, uh, yeah, yeah. And he was regarded, and fundamentally, for him, humanity, full humanity, coincided with uh, whomever read Hobart. Greek-speaking people, yes. There were uh, non-barbarian slaves, actually, quite a lot. Absolutely. I mean, Greeks enslaved each other quite a lot. Yes, yes, they did. But what he discussed, is, I mean, the most famous Greek person before classical time was a slave, Isopus, Isop, uh, as, you know, the fable maker. So he was a slave. Uh, Eventually, philosophers recognize that there is something fundamentally unfair about that. Only barbarians should be enslaved. <laughs> By the way, this is exactly parallel to a biblical and then Talmudic position. Because Hebrew slaves, which did exist, you should let go after seven years. You cannot keep them in perpetuity. But barbarian slaves, you can. Right? So there was no, I mean, the idea that there are ours and theirs was there, nobody argued. Think about it. Uh, did, uh, were the Greeks convinced that there is no other civilization that exists that's greater than them and they just haven't discovered it yet? Were they? Because uh, sort of, they knew that they haven't traveled everywhere. They had myth, right, but they really haven't. Did Greeks believe that they were the greatest civilization? Nothing of the kind. Greeks constantly go, and you know, if you start reading Plato, he always talks about great Egyptians. I mean, when we look at the Egyptians, watch this last, there's nothing. But Greeks were always saying, oh, eternal wisdom of the Egyptians. Did they recognize great wisdom of the Jews? No. Nobody did. No, no, but my, my question was, like, if they would recognize this, then there's a possibility that they could become slaves of a, they would be barbarians with respect to this greatest civilization, and then their whole logic would be turned. OK, no, not according to them. You see, what they saw, they saw very great civilizations. They constantly talked about sort of these ancient things. They were new. Greeks have this very clear understanding. They're newcomers in this old world. Their ancestors just came. You know, they descend from you know, these heroes who, who came just a few generations back, 400 years, 500 years, 600 years, right? recent. And there is this immemorial civilization. You know, they know even a very recent civilization of the great king Persians. They thought was splendid, but barbarian. You know, that one of the greatest books, which I never mentioned, is uh, the book by Xenophon, whom I did mention, Education of Cyrus. This is sort of a novel where he describes the education of a great Persian king, and, you know, how he became so great. And he's presented as a model for, for the Greeks. And they knew, for example, you know, any Greek knew and would tell you, yeah, I mean, we lie and cheat and Persians are upright. They knew that because they did lie and cheat. Maybe not Spartans, but you know, Athenians had no no question about yes, no question about 
themselves. They were lies and cheaters, democratic society. But they had this certain thing, this understanding of human dignity, which no other civilization. Yes, these people have esoteric wisdom. But you see, only Greeks would never prostrate themselves. This was the only society they knew. And as far as I know, the only society ever where you would rather die than prostrate. People did die, they wouldn't prostrate before the great king. You know, the part of the Oriental thing, you have to prostrate before the king, before the god. Greeks do not. You have this absolute human dignity. That's why they cannot be slaves, Greeks. But other people can, because they do prostrate. It's not simple. Again, one of the things which I do recommend, I remember, is that do not, this is my constant argument with Boris, do not, he always comes with theories. Very good theories, very original. I, I'm not being sarcastic. But often they're not based on the large body of facts. So yes, you have to first you know, read Plato, lots of Plato, read even if you want to have your own theory about Greeks, you have to read lots of Greeks, which, you know, we cannot generalize. Right now, everybody knows that we're all equal. Therefore, I could have my own opinion. Actually, the answer is no. You cannot. I mean, unless opinion is based on facts, you have no right to have it. Like, you shouldn't have opinion. Have you studied brain surgery? No, probably. Therefore, you shouldn't have any opinions on the fact. You don't know. We have to acquire, I know it's very controversial statement, but I believe it. Yes? Greek civilization was truly great. Why the decline? <laughs> ah, that we are, OK. It's, it's a great question, and part of it we will discuss in the next, next lecture, because there was this amazing thing. Romans come, and the progress stops. And when the progress stops, decline starts. Romans didn't want the decline. But nor did they really want progress. Not in these things. I can have. We already know all the theorems. We don't want any more theorems. And we for sure don't want the proofs. Who cares about I mean, engineers just need to know the results. <laughs> huh? So the progress stops. And this starts this sort of the creative spirit of Greek civilization. Romans mummified the Greek civilization. And it's still not fully what they had, their freedom. Their, you know, when I read them, it's astonishing. It's just, I mean, they're, they're, they're so amazing in terms of what they, their minds were. Not even, I mean, the, uh, yes. And then. So the amazing thing about Aristotle for me is that so for, he was a true scientist, OK? And, uh, Together with that, he gave a damn about politics. Okay? He wrote a book about politics. <coughs> well, he did give it. I mean, he didn't give a damn about politics. Politics, politics. Politics, he did. Yeah, exactly. He yes. Wrote a book. He wrote a book yes, but he didn't write well, which is again not. <coughs> what you might not know is that his main writings were not this. Which I said, he didn't probably write any. These are lecture notes by semi-literate students. What he wrote and was very proud of were dialogues where he was imitating his teacher. And nothing is extant. Well, not to know, I mean, three lines, I, or whatever, few fragments, nothing. They perished. So this is an amazing thing. All of the things where he wanted to write beautifully disappeared. I mean, it is a tragedy. I mean, 
you know, the, we will, you know, the the amount of stuff. Think about it. I mean, out of say hundred plays of Sophocles, how many are extant? Seven. Seven percent. I really need to invent that job to go back before <laughs> yeah, Alexandria Library was burned. It's it was it wasn't just that. It was the gradual decline. People were reading less and less. They were not caught. I mean, there was a. Dec I mean, we will be addressing your. There will be a whole lecture on Romans, and their contribution and positive and negative. No, what? That sorry. I definitely haven't read as much as you, but my... Nobody did. <laughs> but my image about Greeks is that despite every great things, they were also very dysfunctional. Uh, so, so, so coming back to why... It was a dysfunctional society in the fall. It was a perfect society for as long as it was 60,000, 100,000, up to that limit. They could not. It's the geography. The geography made them great. The geography caused the decline. Uh, and, and in the light of that, I mean, you know, Athens is the, the best example. I mean, Athens, you know, raises uh, from pretty much nothing. I mean, essentially from ashes, stealing money from the other Greek states, having, um, you know, essentially programs for the poor from other people's money and other things like that which we do it too we do it <laughs> no no but, but, but nothing go i mean my point is that things are very nice but it's very hard to imagine sustainability and you know they collapse uh, they didn't did they collapse did greeks collapse because of their political ineptness first of all before they so-called collapse, they conquered the world. There was this, to a large extent, I mean, all the way to Punjab. That's Alexander, which is, yeah, anyway. Whether he was Greek does not matter because he thought of himself as Greek. Right? So Greeks managed to conquer the large part of Mediterranean. I wish they went the other way and conquered Italy. They created this huge empire, spread their language, which became for the next several hundred years, well into, say, third, till third century BC, it's the universal language. If you went to France, you had to speak Greek. If you went to Rome, you had to speak Greek. If you want to Rome, was a Roman emperor, you wanted to write a book on philosophy, as one of them did, you wrote it in Greek, Marcus Aurelius. It was a universal language, from the high culture to, you know, you want to go shopping, you know, farmer's market, you needed Greek. That was a trading language. Greeks created this. So they created this enormous infrastructure. We'll be talking about, you know, we are running ahead. But it's, it's a more complicated. You're looking at classical Greek city-state and say that, that greatness was not sustainable. But it became a different greatness. You know, the, this Alexander goes, starts Alexandria, which becomes enormous cultural center. That's where Euclid is written, right? So this is not, any, I mean, if we produced anything comparable to Euclid here, I would be very happy. But, but to some extent, <laughs> the, the Hellenistic states are, are not really Greece in itself. And, and they are, you know, they are Alexander. It's the same civilization. What does Alexander carry and puts under his pillow? What is the book which he carries everywhere he goes? One book. Yes, very good. He is learning. He is learning. Ilya is catching up. Give him another hundred years, he'll catch up with me. Uh, but, but you know, he started. He started late. What could I? Do? That is a shorter path. Yes, 
two books, uh, your dad. But uh, one of them is like that. So, but that's the main one. If you're fountain head is not important. Uh, I shouldn't mention, you know, I rather talk about Harry Potter. Uh, <laughs> what? No, no. The, I mean, look, the damage this stuff causes from my point of view, again, any simplistic solution, by the way, anybody who comes to you and says, there is a science fiction book which answers all your problems, run away. There, re there is a new science fiction somebody told me yesterday about Greeks uh, starting some society, Greek God starting science fiction book. Very, very brainy. Uh, don't read it. What, what, it's, you will hear about it uh, in general. Good things tend to be hard. Huh? I do not know any notice. If you look at all the books, none of them are actually easy. Many of them are borderline accessible. Even Shakespeare, even the language. By the way, it was hard in 1600. His language was totally incomprehensible then because he was making every other word. Just, just like that. So do not think, ah, oh, you know, we could translate him into a modern language. You couldn't translate him. Not enough words. Uh, so. Uh, what are we talking about? <laughs> We're talking about Greeks. So it's a more, you know, in some sense, that is what we will be discussing the next lecture. Right? So it's not, you're, you're running, is it, do I cry for Athens of the classical age? Yes, of course I do. Every person for the last 20, 2,500 years does. Yes. Sort of. Would I want? You know, Aeschylus and Sophocles and Euripides instead of Hollywood? Oh, yes, trust me. But it lasted a very short period of time. I mean, that the classical age, the great classical age, however you define it, sort of lasted maybe 80 years. Yes? You talked about political experiments that the Greeks were doing with written systems and their constitutions. Could you share some? Could I share the political experiments? I can. Uh, you know, the, basically, we talked about Sparta trying to create this communistic but caste society. Uh, we talked about. Uh, Tyranny, a very popular form of government, which created a great societies in places like Syracuse. For example, when we talk about Archimedes, I mean, he was the product of tyranny. Sounds awful, but he was. Sort of uh, semi-enlightened tyrants of Syracuse. Didn't do such a bad job when we look at the results. And then there were multiple experiments in Athens, I mean, all over the place, from kings to tyrants to demo democracy, direct democracy. There were no one thing Greeks never invented is representative democracy. Greek idea, if you want to decide, you go vote. When they would set up colonies, would they copy the political model of, of this, the mother city, yes. Colony never was like on its own. It was, we are colony of Sparta. Therefore, we will imitate Spartan ways. We're colony of Athens. We're colony of Corinth. We're, right? So it's a mother city. It's typically, another thing, you, it's hard for us to imagine. Greek is a terrible, terrible place. You really, in most places, you just cannot, I mean, you cannot even feed your children. It's a small, small island. It's not like, you know, it's, we have infinite amount of land. Even in California, say so we have too many people. You drive 30 miles, there is no one. But they didn't have 30 miles. It's either an island or there are 
terrible mountains, a little valley. So they had to always spawn colonies. Right? And they had these problems. I mean, you know, limiting the population size, you know, the literally killing off the old people. You know, they, it was tough. It's precisely the toughness of their physical things which enabled them to become what they are. I mean, it's tough. They had to come up with all kind of creative ideas. They, you know, they had to struggle. This is not here you stick a, put a stick in the earth and, you know, big tree comes. I mean, it's tough there. It's really tough. You know, even now, I mean, you could ask Nick. I mean, he, he knows. I mean, it's a stony, hilly country. You know, it's, a, it's, it's a tough environment, and it's very cold during the winter by our standards, and it's extremely hot during the summer, and the water is precious. You don't have enough. It's, it's, they, uh, this is what made them. You see, it's not like Persians. They had these huge you know, areas. They didn't. I'm not even talking about Russia. Where you know, it was hundred square kilometers per person, I mean, or so it seems. When you fly over Siberia, it's amazing. I mean, there's nothing. It's green and green and green and green. I mean, yeah, there are a couple of cities there, but you don't fly over them, so it's just. From the plane, you know, in 10 hours, you get a full view of just that, you know. Forest and forest and forest. But Greeks are not like that. Very, very. You know. They would go. This is why they go to Italy. That's why they go as far as France and Spain. Their colonies all over the place. Right. Again, using Plato's language, this is one of my favorite, is that Greeks are like frogs around the pond. They, they, they sort of, that, that was their pond, Mediterranean, and they would just jump and jump and jump. Little con They never go inland. They, because for them, sort of not having the sea next door was this sort of amazing. I mean, one of the famous stories, everybody knows it, but um, there is this uh, book by Xenophon, wonderful. Uh, the, you know, the expedition uh, of 5,000, when the, the Greek mercenaries are returning from the middle of Persia, and they go through Armenia and Caucasus, and then finally, they see the sea. And it's like they, they are ecstatic. That's freedom. They are home. They don't, they're very far from home. They see the wrong sea. It's Black Sea. It's not Mediterranean. But it's all right. They could make a boat and they could get home. They're home. They were, you know, they liked sea. You know, Odyssey with Odysseus traveling around. That's their poem. Or Iliad. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But these are amazing people, yes, which you have to go far. But, you know, they, they're wonderful. They were wonderful. I hope they will become wonderful again. Uh, you know, look, I, you know, I, I have high hopes. Give them two or three hundred more years. They might come back. I mean, I still believe they're the same people. I, you know. Well, I mean, do, uh, yes, they are the same people, really. Yeah. They, yeah, 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 of course. Some of the Egyptians are the same people, Copts are the same people. No, no, no. Most of Egyptians are Copts. Even they're not religiously Copts. Changing your religion doesn't change your background. Yes? So. Not, not in that sense. But Greeks are Greeks. There is a direct, I mean, direct line. You know, I, I know every step of the way, and some of it I will cut. But you know, it's not. There are not some unknown people. There are no other Do Dorian invasions. I mean, they're, they're Greeks.